allow me to introduce our guest speaker today. Chris Jones is a husband and father of four from Harrodsburg. He is a pastoral resident at Grace Church in Danville, Kentucky, and he writes regularly for the Gospel Center Discipleship. Chris is also a Christian hip-hop artist and producer for Christ Centric. Chris and his wife desired a church plant in Harrodsburg. Please welcome Chris Jones to us this morning. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Can y'all hear me okay? I don't know if that's my mic or yeah, his mic. Yeah, I think it probably is. It's good. Okay. All right. Uh, it's a it's a blessing to be here this morning. I actually met Pastor Donovan at the Proclaim Him Expository Preachers Conference and. Uh, it's always a blessing to be able to open God's Word and share it with people, uh, especially on uh, an occasion like this where uh, we're celebrating unity within our nation. We're celebrating uh, a, a man like Martin Luther King tomorrow. Uh, and the message I want to bring is not about Martin Luther King, uh, but rather is about the, the gospel that uh, Martin Luther King was influenced by. And um, I want us to, to look at John chapter 17 and... Um, you might think I'm kind of crazy for this, but we're actually going to start at verse 13. So we're kind of in the middle of Jesus's prayer. But I think it's important for us to start here to see what the Lord has for us this morning. Amen. So I'm going to start at verse 13. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version Bible. Um, I know you all probably read from the New King James. It's pretty similar. But now I am coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the, word, the world may believe that you have sent me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for Jesus' high priestly prayer. We thank you for your Holy Spirit to open our eyes, open our hearts, and open our minds to hear this truth. Father, I pray that you would get me out of the way, that you would shine bright through your word, through this message this morning. I pray that you convict our hearts and prepare us to worship you and to respond in obedience, faith, and love for you. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. 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 So, I'm only 32 years old. I'll actually be 33 this month. So I haven't lived as much life as uh, some of you in this room have. Uh, may have lived a little more than some of you. Uh, but when I speak to older folks like my grandmother or my great uncle Kenneth, they tell me that they feel that America is more divided now than they've ever seen. Now, I don't know about you all, but I kind of resonate with that. But what's crazy is they grew up during the harsh Jim Crow era. They grew up uh, segregated bathrooms, segregated restaurants and movie theaters. They raised children during the civil rights era. My parents are contemporaries of Martin Luther King's uh, work and, and speeches and everything. My dad remembers the assassination of King, or at least my mother does, and, and they still feel that the country is more divided now than it was back then. And as we look on the horizon, we see all kinds of reasons for America to be fractured. Uh, all I have to do is mention the word COVID and a million different ideas pop into our minds. Should we wear masks? Should we get shots? Uh, should we social distance? Are we scared for no reason? Should we be taking the new wave more seriously? If we mention politics, things get even uglier, right? Like, is the government trying to take us out? Are they overstepping their boundaries or should, should they be doing more to boost the economy? Should they forgive student loans? Should they raise taxes on the rich? Should they dictate what's being taught in our schools? Another challenging issue of our day is race and racial animosity in America. Should we follow what's being taught by CRT? 
Does Fox News have the best discussion on race? Or what about CNN? Uh, should we say black lives matter? Or should we be colorblind? Or should blue lives matter? Or should all lives matter? Are all of these things we're fighting over, we're divided over in our country. But I've got good news for you this morning. I'm not here to answer any of those questions. I'm not. I'm not a news analyst. I'm not a sociologist. I'm not here for that. I'm here to answer the question, what is the solution to the division in America in the church? Because when we look out into the world, we can't solve that. All those things I just listed, the world will never come to the same conclusion on. But as Christians and as your people, we can take our strong opinions and we can submit them to the gospel. And what the Lord is going to show us this morning in his word is that regardless of our opinions and our perspectives on these matters that we've discussed so far, if we stand in unity and love for one another in the ultimate and eternal matters of the gospel, we will not hinder the, mes the mission of the church. Mm -hmm. so, so as we think about this, the, the main point that I want you to walk away with is this. The kind of church that the world needs today is a joyful, holy, and unified church that is committed to showing and sharing the gospel. Amen. Amen. I'm going to say that again. The world needs a joyful, a holy, and a unified church that is committed to showing and sharing the gospel. Now, the context of John 17, Jesus is nearing his crucifixion and starting in John 13, he's he's having this upper room discourse. It's his last uh, kind of final speech in time with his disciples before he will be betrayed and crucified. So he's preparing them for his death. And then John 17 is is probably labeled in your Bible as the high priestly prayer. Jesus is preparing himself. He's he's getting himself and his disciples ready to be sacrificed for us. And so in our section, starting in verse 13, the first thing we see this morning is that the world is watching the church. The world is watching the church. If you're a student of the text, you'll notice that from verse 13 to verse 21, Jesus mentions the world 10 times. Jesus mentions the world 10 times in our text. Because we are being watched by the world and we are in the world. So often as Christians, it's easy to focus on our holiness. It's easy to focus on in-house matters. But what will you be doing tomorrow or Tuesday morning when you wake up at 6 or 7 a.m.? Where will you spend most of your day throughout the upcoming week? Where will you get your groceries? Where will you go when your children are playing sports or your grandchildren? What will you, where will you spend most of your life? I'm going to tell you something. If you spend most of your life in here, you've got something wrong. We spend most of our lives out into the world. And that's what this section is telling us. And what we see in verses 14 and 16 is Christians are in the world, but not of the world. And that sounds cliche, but this is where that comes from. Look with me at verse 14. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. And so what we see is we are not of the world just as Christ is not of the world. Verse 16. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. So specifically, Jesus shows us that the unbelievers, they're watching our lives, but they're watching them with hatred and animosity. Verse 13, they hate them. Or sorry, verse 14, they, the world has hated them. The world hates us. We're not in Christian America anymore. Not that a nation was ever totally Christian, but now especially the world looks at us and they hate us. We are starting to feel and understand what Jesus is saying. There's an aversion and a hostility and there are threats coming at us because of who we are. But it's not because of our failures. It's not because of our personality. It's because they hated Jesus. Just as wicked Cain watched Abel and was ready to pounce and kill him, so the world is watching us. Just as the Jews faced animosity when they were trying to rebuild the temple, so the world wants to stop our efforts to worship God today. Just as the unsaved Jews and Greeks killed Jesus and wanted to stop him, they want to stop us today. 
And yet Jesus did not ask his father to take us out of the world. Jesus says twice, we're not of the world. The substance of a believer is that we have been born again. Your physical body was born in this world. You were once totally depraved, as your pastor has said. But when you have been made new, when the spirit has regenerated you and given you a new heart, put a new spirit in you, given you new life, you are no longer of the world. We are just like Jesus, no longer of the world, but of heaven. God has placed his spirit in us. He has given us heavenly life. We are not of the world. And then notice in verse 15, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Jesus asked his father to keep us from the evil one. Notice he doesn't ask us to be removed, but rather that God would do the keeping while we're here. Because he's about to go off. He's about to ascend into heaven. And his disciples are going to wonder, what do I do? What will we do? Where will we go? And Jesus says, the Father has got you. I have asked him to keep you while you're here. For God to keep us, it means for him to watch over, to guard, and to take care of us. Jesus is praying for the fatherly care of his people in light of the threatenings and the attacks of the evil one. Now, the, when we see this word keep, remember uh, how shepherds are sometimes called the keeper of the sheep. They guard the gate. They keep the gate so that nothing can come in and harm the sheep. And when King David was guarding the sheep, he might have to tackle a lion or a bear. When a shepherd shows up to guard the sheep or to keep the sheep, he protects their lives. And in fact, Jesus says bad shepherds or false shepherds run in the face of danger, but God is going to keep us. Right. The good shepherd, Jesus Christ, is going to keep us. And though we're frightful and we often run in the face of danger, God will keep us. Now, I, I want to remind you, as we read of this keeping, keeping from the evil one, this may bring to mind the Lord's prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or deliver us from the evil one. We need to pray that because we are in the world and the evil one wants to devour and destroy us. If you're praying, people pray through the Lord's Prayer regularly, asking the Lord to keep you. But then notice something very special about the world. Sometimes it may seem, well, well maybe Jesus just forgot about us. But, but read verse 18. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Notice the action, the activeness of that verb. I have sent them. He didn't say I have left them. Jesus didn't leave us in the world sort of waiting until he gets back. He didn't, he didn't leave us sort of hoping and, and praying that someday we'll just get swept up out of here like Enoch. No, I have sent them. Now, what I want to zoom in on here because this is special. As you sent me into the world, he says. Why was Jesus sent into the world? The Bible says he came to seek and save the lost. We celebrated at Christmas. He came to be a human so he could ransom humans. He came to live perfectly righteous because we couldn't be righteous. He came to be killed and hanged on a tree so that we wouldn't have to bear the curse for our sins. He came to rise from the dead with power because when we die, we stay in the grave. Jesus came to take the wages of sin, which is death, from us. Just as you sent me into the world, I send them. But before you can be sent into the world, you have to believe in the Savior who was sent. Have you trusted and believed in the sent Savior, Jesus Christ? the sacrificial lamb of God who is preparing himself in these very moments that we're reading of to go to the cross to die for us. Have you believed that? And if you have, you too have been sent with a purpose. Your purpose is to be a witness of this gospel message, of this Savior, Jesus Christ, of his word, so that the world may believe through you. So as a set people, Jesus' prayer reminds us of some vital truths about how we need to act in the world. So my second point this morning is that Jesus prayed for the, the church to be joyful, 
holy and united in the world. So we know we're here. How are we to live? The first element we see here is in verse 13. Verse 13, Jesus says here, but now I'm coming to you and these things I speak in the world. So I speak it while I'm still here. Why? These things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And uh, in John chapter 15, 11, it's actually right on the next page in my Bible. He says that he wants our, his joy to be in us and our joy to be full. One of the defining marks of the people of God is great joy. And in fact, joy is a fruit of the spirit. It's the first evidence of the fruit of the spirit within us. But you may be wondering, what is joy? Joy is great gladness. It's a state of rejoicing. And we see temporal joy when UK wins a basketball game. But when Louisville beats UK, that joy fades, doesn't it? When UK only makes it to the NIT, our joy in UK basketball is gone. But true joy doesn't fade with losses or trials because it's deeper than our circumstances. The Bible speaks of true joy that is unspeakable and too great for words to express because of the love and work of God. This joy is given by God, it originates in God, and it is made full and brought to completion and perfection through Jesus dying on the cross. If you came in depressed this morning, if you came in hopeless this morning, there is joy that Jesus loved you enough to die on the cross for you. If you have believed the gospel and you are in him, you have joy unspeakable because you wake up not an enemy of God any longer, but at peace with God. That is the source of true joy. And he prayed his prayer and gave his disciples these parting words. Without these words, they would have been overcome with sorrow. They would have been afraid. But as we remember this prayer, let us not lose joy. We're in joyless days. <clears throat> We're in days of division, depression, discouragement, hatred. Every time you turn on the news or social media, it's something joyless. But we have a joy that is deeper than anything COVID could rob from us. Anything racial animosity, anything politics can steal from us. Because they can't take our Jesus away. Amen. They can't take the gospel from us. They can't remove us from the hand of God. So we've got something to be joyful about despite what's going on around us. But Jesus has also called us to be holy. Notice uh, verse 17 of this prayer he says sanctify them in the truth your word is truth Ho sanctify or make holy or to set apart is what Jesus is asking for and, and I remember as a young Christian uh, seeing me and my friends put ourselves in sinful scenarios you know we're young and dumb and we're thinking oh if, if we watch this movie with these people or we do these things we can look at the world and say hey we're just like you we're not those high and mighty self-righteous Christians. We're just sinners like you. But that's not what Jesus prayed here. Jesus prayed the opposite. We're not just like the world. Are we human? Yes. Are we needy? Yes. Are we flawed? Yes. But are we just like the world? No. We are sanctified and set apart. And actually, when the Bible speaks of sanctification, it speaks of it in two ways. In one sense, we've been sanctified, past tense. But in another sense, we are being progressively sanctified and made more holy. So while the sentiment of wanting to relate to unbelievers and be welcoming is, is good, the statement we're just like you is so far from the truth. And it's so far from what Jesus prayed. He said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And then in verse 19, for their sake, I consecrate, which in the Greek is the same word as sanctify. I sanctify, I consecrate myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. So what is Jesus saying? He's asking his father to make us holy, to set us apart from the world as we're in the world, in our thoughts and our actions. So while we're here, we can still be separate. Now, I love the Amish people. I love the Mennonites. But I do fear that they may have gone a little too far with being separate from the world. We don't have to be separate in the way we look. We don't have to be separate in the way we live. You know, we don't have to live like it's the 1800s or the 1600s. 
But what this means, when Jesus speaks of setting us apart and making us holy, it's our actions, it's our words, it's this truth. And that's what we're going to see in just a second. He's asking his father to make us holy through what? Sanctify them in truth. The biggest separator from the believer and the unbeliever today is going to be what truth do you stand on? As a matter of fact, in a post-truth world, the biggest thing to separate us from the world might be the fact that you believe in truth. That you believe there's a truth for everyone. An objective, absolute truth. Right. Right. This truth. But that's what separates us from the world. Jesus asked his father to make us holy through his word. And God does this through his spirit of truth. The helper, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the comforter who would come when Jesus ascended. He prepared himself. When, when Jesus says in, in verse 19, I consecrate myself in order that you may be holy. What he's saying is I've lived a holy life. I'm the priest. And, and in the Old Testament, they had, to they had to consecrate or sanctify the offering before they could offer it up. Jesus is saying, all of my life, in this very moment, I am preparing myself. I am consecrating myself. I am setting myself apart for this sacrifice on the cross that they, that we might be sanctified. Without the work of Jesus, without the sanctifying, consecrating of himself, we don't have hope of holiness. But because of what Jesus did on that cross, because of giving us his righteousness, because of sending us the spirit of truth, we too can be sanctified or consecrated to God. In a post-Christian anti-truth world, pursuing the truth matters immensely. R.C. Sproul said simply, falsehood corrupts us. We are in a culture of alternate facts. And these alternate facts, they destroy us. The church must never spread a lie because we are people of truth. More importantly, we are people of the gospel truth, which sets us free. The same truth that will sanctify us and make us more like Christ is the gospel, which is the power of God to save the world around us. But well, we've got to be truth seekers. We've got to cling to that. We've got to be growing in our knowledge and in our application of the truth in order to fight the lies in our society. If you're a note taker, I want you to, to write this uh, acronym down that, that the Lord has, has shown me this year. B-U-O-Y, buoy. When you read the Bible, when you study the word, I want you to remember this and pray through this. B, Lord, help me believe your word. Because in an, in an age of false truth, in an age of anti-truth, we've got to pray for belief. We've got to believe every word in this book. Number two, Holy Spirit, help me understand your word. We need belief. We need understanding. We need to know what the word means. Because you know, there are people out there telling us the word doesn't mean what it says it means. But that we've got to know what it means. Yes. Oh, Lord, help me to obey your word. It's not enough to believe and understand it if we will not obey it. And then why? Lord, help me yearn for truth. Give me a yearning for your word so that we keep coming back to it and back to it. The truth of the gospel should never get old. We need to be people who are truth seekers. Right. And then the third thing that Jesus shows us in his prayer of how we are to live in this world is to pursue unity. Look at verses 20 through 21. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one. I'm going to read that again and let the word settle on us here. I do not ask for these only. I'm not just asking for my disciples, but for those who will believe in me through them that they may all be one. Jesus is praying for us. He's not just praying for the 12 disciples, the apostles. He's praying for you and I. If you felt unloved, if you felt worthless or distant from Christ this week, Jesus prayed for you. Jesus loves you. You are not worthless. The, the God, the creator of the universe who came in the flesh had you in his mind when he prayed this prayer. Jesus loves you. He cares for you. And in a very real sense, this prayer for unity is already answered. I can show up here this morning 
and we are united because we are in Christ. And that's what Jesus is speaking of here. The union that we have with Christ. It's a mystical union. What that means is we can't see it. We can't feel it. We can't touch it. But we know that we're united with Christ because his Holy Spirit is in me. His Holy Spirit is in you. His Holy Spirit is in the Christian in the Middle East, the Christian in China, the Christian in Africa. The Holy Spirit that is in us that raised Jesus from the dead unites us to God and he unites us to one another. Jesus uses strong language. This is not an exaggeration. Jesus says, just as we are one. I think that's beautiful language. Verse 21, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Is, is Jesus ever at odds with his Father? Do they ever fight and fuss? Are they ever not united? And Jesus is saying, just as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Trinity, are united and one, we are to be one. This doesn't mean accepting every false truth that comes towards us. This doesn't mean that we push that truth aside that we just talked about in the face of unity. That's not what this means. To put it another way, I'm more united to you all than I am to a black person who doesn't love Christ. My skin color doesn't unite me to somebody. I'm more united to you all than I am my family members who don't believe the gospel. I don't accept everything they say and say, oh, we're united. Rather, we are united in Christ and in the gospel and in the truth. Our union with Christ and our unity with one another are part of our eternal unity with God. We will always and forever be united to God. And how did we get there? The love of God. In love, he predestined us to be conformed. It, it was in love that God sought us out, that he chose us out and brought us in him. It was nothing that we had to offer. There was nothing we could bring to the table. And that's a beautiful and glorious truth because you can't mess it up. Keep on believing and keep on seeking unity. But here's where I want to get practical. Pursuing this real union in everyday life is tough right now. If we're not pursuing joy in Christ and walking in holiness, unity will be extremely difficult. So what are some practical ways that we can pursue unity in these divisive times? Number one, refuse to reject a brother or sister in Christ on matters that are not central to the gospel or sound doctrine. What do I mean here? I mean, know the right hills to die on. We should never divide from our brothers and sisters in Christ over politics, over social theories, over educational preferences, over medical opinions, over religious traditions, or anything else we want to divide over. Can we have discussions and debates? Of course we can. But at the end of the day, I'm locking arms with believers when I go out into this world. How dare we choose a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent over a brother and sister in Christ? We have got to choose one another. We've got to refuse to reject each other over the stuff the world tells us to divide over. We cannot do it. And if I'm honest, I've been tempted to do this over the past couple of years. It's easy. You get in these echo chambers and all of a sudden they are against us and now us as me and unbelievers. It can't be that way. Number two, recognize that you could be wrong. When a godly brother or sister disagrees with you on something divisive, maybe you should try to listen because maybe you've been wrong. I know I've been wrong a million times. Ask my wife. <laughs> so I know I can be wrong and I know that I can be hard-headed and I can be opinionated. But I'm learning to recognize that maybe, just maybe, this little finite 32-year-old doesn't know everything about the world just yet. Maybe. <laughs> Number three, repent of divisive thoughts and attitudes the moment you spot them rising up in your heart. That sounds simple, right? But right when that flesh wants to rise up, rather than harbor an attitude of bitterness or wrath or pride or self-centeredness, confess that to God and turn it over. Turn it over. 
Again, when we get in our echo chamber, it's easy to, to see our flesh rise up. They agree with me. I'm just going to keep talking to them. They disagree with me. I'll just stay away from them. We don't have that option across these aisles in this church. And then lastly, reach out to hurting brothers and sisters, even if you don't understand what they're going through. To give you a real example, when George Floyd was killed, that was tough for me. To watch him die on TV the way he died, to, to process that was very challenging. And I had kind of two responses from some of my buddies. One was, hey man, do you think he was guilty? I heard he had fentanyl in the system. I heard he was a rough guy. The other guys are like, hey man, how are you processing this? I don't know what's going on. I know, I know you don't know all the details, but how are you handling this? Obviously, this conversation was a lot better for me because I don't know all the details about George Floyd, but I do know that he died on television and it did not look real good. And so in that moment, rather than picking fights and analyzing and trying to, you know, prove this, uh, this view or grab this from TV and say this, let's just love each other. When a police officer is killed in the line of duty by some idiot who killed him, I want to resonate with that police officer because his family now doesn't have a dad and a husband. His mother lost a son. And you all know very close to home how that is. We need to listen and love people even if we don't know all the facts and don't understand the details. Weep with those who weep. Mourn with those who mourn. And when we get the details later, after we've processed it, then we can start to analyze and talk about those things. It's important because we're people of truth. We can't believe a lie. But sometimes in the moment, we just need to love each other. So you may be tempted to wonder, why does all this matter? Why well, spend so much time and effort dealing with unity and holiness and, and joy when we can just stay in our circles and get along with each other? If I'm a Republican Christian, why can't I just talk to Republicans and ignore them liberals? If I'm an independent, why can't I just ignore all of it? Here's why. Read with me in verse 21. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. Now listen, this is Jesus' words, not mine. So that the world may believe that you sent me. Amen. When we see so that, that means whatever was before it, the so that is what happens after. Unity and joy and holiness are so that the world may believe that God sent Jesus. I'm not going to use hyperbole. I don't think Jesus is using hyperbole. I don't think he's exaggerating here. But what we do to each other affects how the world believes in Jesus. Your actions can directly, negatively impact how the world views the gospel, or they can positively impact how the world views Christ. I'm not trying to be a downer here. Hopefully it encourages us that our love can help the world see the love of Christ better. How are they supposed to know we're his except by our love for one another, John says. So the negative side is you can hinder unbelievers from wanting to see the gospel and wanting to trust Christ. But on a positive side, our unity, when the world looks into the church and says, how are they doing that? We can tell them Jesus did. This isn't kumbaya stuff. This is our unity with Christ. When you're united to Christ and you're united to one another, the world is going to look in here and say, that's crazy. When a Republican black Christian and a Democrat black Christian, and obviously there's some ideologically, uh, ideological stuff there, but when two differing political opinions come together and say we love each other because of the gospel, the world looks in and says, that's crazy. And we say, yes, because the gospel has made us new. And the Democrat can say, I don't agree with everything over here, but I agree with some things. The Republican can say, I don't agree with everything. The Independent can say, I don't agree with everything, but we know that we agree on Christ. Amen. We know that we agree on the gospel. We know that we are one in Christ because he died on the cross and rose again and made us new. We are united because we have the spirit in us. And then maybe the world says, we want some of that. Ain't that what happened in the book of Acts? As the church was scattered, as the Jew and the Gentile came together, that's worse than black and white because it was religious. 
it was forever when the Samaritans entered the church. Everybody wanted to get in on that. So you would see thousands of people saved. The church grew. We've got to be careful, church. We cannot divide over COVID-19. We can't divide over George Floyd. We can't divide over any of this stuff. If the world looks at a divided church fussing over the same stuff they're fighting about, it puts a hurdle in front of the gospel. The answer is not to fix them liberals. The answer is not to silence the conservatives or cancel the independents. It's not for everyone to get the COVID shot. It's not for everyone to take their mask off and just get over it. It's not for the dissenters to shut up and be canceled. The answer is for each and every one of us to get a Christ-centered view of one another. If I view you the way Christ views you, I can't hate you over politics. If I view my lost neighbor as Christ views them, I can't hate them over politics. Because they need the gospel. So at the end of the day, we need to view everyone as image bearers of Christ through the lens of the gospel. Because the gospel is the answer. And when we are made new and empowered by the gospel and by the spirit to live out these truths, we become the type of church the world needs. I'll say it a million times. I don't care if it's a black person or a white person, an Asian, a Middle Eastern or a Hispanic. I don't care. The gospel is the answer. Not just believing it, but also living in light of it. And when you live in light of the gospel, your actions will reflect the unity that we're talking about. America can be fixed if we all believe the gospel, right? We can be people marked by joy, holiness, and unity. And the dying world can see Christ through us. This is the kind of church they need. But sprinting into the icy wind of our culture will be difficult and it will be painful. But isn't that the race of the faith? Isn't the race of faith difficult? But with the gracious power of the Holy Spirit, with our eyes on Jesus, we can make it. We can keep pressing on. If we pray to our holy and heavenly Father, if we seek His kingdom, we will be so focused on the kingdom of heaven, we won't try to build earthly kingdoms. If we align our hearts with God's heart through prayer and grace-driven obedience in the word, we can fight for the joy and the holiness and the unity that Jesus prayed for in John 17. Fighting to live in the light of Jesus' prayer means we'll have to walk in repentance. Just as you have to look over your shoulder when you switch lanes to see if you've got blind spots, you need to check your heart for blind spots. You need to ask your spouse your friends, your church members, the people around you, where are my blind spots? If you don't believe that there are blind spots, go ask Jonathan Edwards or George Whitfield when you get to heaven. How did you miss that slavery was bad? I truly believe it was a blind spot. And I believe we all have blind spots. Every one of us, from me to Martin Luther King to Martin Luther to John Calvin to Augustine, we all have areas where we don't see the gospel clearly, where it hasn't fully taken root in our heart. And we need to ask for the Lord to reveal that. Practically, this might mean apologizing or taking down that Facebook post that you shared yesterday. It might mean shifting the conversation when divisive issues come up at work. It might mean turning off the news and opening your Bible the first thing in the morning. It definitely means assessing your heart and your actions. Are you moving towards cynicism and division? And then lastly, it's going to take hard work. Jesus says the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. An old writer said it is better to take pains than to suffer pains. It's better to be bound with the chains of duty than to be bound with the chains of darkness. In other words, work hard to pursue unity and holiness and joy. But remember whose strength you're doing it in. Paul said, I worked harder than them all, but he did it in the strength of Christ. Mission Church here, the Mission Church, you all can be a light in Lexington. You all can shine bright with gospel-centered unity in the face of hostility, in the face of opposition, in the face of oppression. Why? Because you have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in you. You have the gospel shining through you. You have been made new, and that's what the world needs.
Let's pray together, church.